Now, join acclaimed industry analyst, author, and technology influencer, Maribel Lopez, as she reveals how data ecosystems are being redefined. Hello, welcome to the Data and Culture Transformation event presented by Cloudera and TechCrunch. I'm Maribel Lopez, the founder and principal analyst at Lopez Research and the founder of the Data for Betterment Foundation. I'll be your master of ceremonies for this event. I'll start the event with a brief discussion on redefining data culture and developing a data ecosystem. I'll then turn it over to Ram Venkatesh, the chief technology officer of Cloudera. And he will share his thoughts on data culture transformation and technology. Next, Shirley Colley, the Chief Health Analytics Actuary at Discovery Health, will talk about her experiences with data science and machine learning using Cloudera. We'll wrap up with a panel discussion with Ram and Shirley. So let's get started. There are two rapidly evolving aspects of the data market. The first is data culture, and the second is the emergence of data ecosystems. Both of these aspects are important because you can't create a thriving data ecosystem without a change in your data culture. And for years, we've spoke of digital transformation, but everyone on the webcast today has embraced digital. We're now moving to what Lopez Research calls the digital acceleration era. In this era, organizations, regardless of the size of the business, will couple process reinvention with data-driven decision-making throughout the organization. A new data culture emerges where data is considered a product and a strategic asset that's available to everyone in the company. The discussion shifts from asking questions such as, what platform should we purchase for data analysis to how quickly can we provide real-time insight to answer a specific question? And how can we leverage data from third parties now, we've discussed these concepts in the past. However, there are three things that contribute to the change today. And one big shift is that we have a wide range of high-performing assets that allow us to process data. And this frees you as technology leaders from the burden of deciding whether or not technology is working. And you can focus your intention on helping business leaders understand how data can drive the business forward. And with these insights, you can match the right data solutions to specific analytics tasks and align your outputs to your strategic business goals. Now, with these new data strategies comes new responsibilities. You're now data stewards that must ensure data integrity, security, privacy, and governance across your organization and with your partners. A second big change to help you is that Senior business leaders understand the importance of creating a data culture for business agility, and they're seeking your assistance. They're willing to fund new data architecture. For example, in the last Lopez Research benchmark, 76% of the companies we interviewed said that they're investing in new data and analytic structures in 2022. That's great news. And the third trend is that data solutions have become simpler, allowing a wide range of individuals to understand and utilize new data sources. Now, this new connected data culture is the foundation for reinventing business processes, improving your products, and creating new business models. So big changes ahead. Now, once a company has embraced a proactive data-driven culture, it can transition to building data ecosystems to unlock more value from your data. And there are many types of data ecosystems, but for simplicity, I'll split the data ecosystems into two parts, internal and externally collaborative data ecosystems. Um, simply defined, a data ecosystem is the collection of infrastructure, analytics, processes, and applications that are used to analyze and act on your data. Now, it may not sound different from what we've had before. However, we are reimagining the where, the how and the why of analyzing your data. And you must start within your organization because if you don't have accurate connected data flows within your company, you're not equipped to participate in a collaborative ecosystem that expands beyond your environment. An internal data ecosystem breaks down internal silos and provides better insights to individuals within the company. 
It goes beyond the simple dashboards we've had in the past to really enabling business leaders with actionable insight within their applications from many different data sources across the company. And increasingly, your data ecosystems will also need infrastructure that allows you to process and act on information at the edge, closest to where that data is created. And a data ecosystem establishes a culture of data-driven decision-making by helping companies understand their customers, make better pricing, operation, and marketing decisions. So this is the why. And once you've created these processes and infrastructure, now you're able to leverage all the data resources and you're ready to take advantage of connected and collaborative data ecosystems. And a collaborative data ecosystem is a platform that combines data from numerous companies and it builds value through the usage of process data from all of those companies. And this connected data ecosystem really provides a wider value chain for operational efficiencies. These new data sources could be from open data sources or from multiple parties within an industry, or they can come from across sectors and data domains and value chains. So let me give you an example. DataEuropa.eu provides open data access to nearly 1.5 million data sets with information from 36 companies, countries. Meanwhile, Mayo Clinic, a US provider of healthcare, launched a data marketplace called the Clinical Data Analytics Platform in 2020. And it combines and analyzes data from scientific research, uh, de-identified data from Mayo Clinic and other organizations, all with the goal of improving patient health. And this is an example of an industry data ecosystem. And a third data ecosystem could be multiple manufacturers sharing data within multiple industries in a supply chain. So data, by Capgemini says that only a majority of organizations, 39% are using data-driven tools for a sustainable advantage. But those that have gone to data ecosystems have really improved their customer satisfaction by 15% according to Capgemini, improved productivity by 14%, and reduced cost by 11%. So clearly there's a significant opportunity ahead of us as we embrace the concept of data ecosystems. And to get you there, you need to define a strategy for collaborative data ecosystems with a few vital questions, like how do we exchange data among partners in the ecosystem? How do we manage identity and access? Um, how can we define data domains and storage? How do we manage access to non-local data access? How do we scale the system? And one of the most overlooked aspects is what is the business model and revenue opportunities for the participants? So once you've answered these questions, you can begin courting data partners for collaborative data ecosystems. However, job one for you is to get your own data house in order. It requires creating a culture of data sharing and infusing data into existing applications that make insights accessible throughout the company. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ram for a deeper dive into the art of the possible in data. And now, what is this data transformation all about with Cloudera CTO, Ram Venkatesh? Thank you, Maribo. So exciting to be here today. I agree with the importance of defining a strategy for your collaborative data ecosystem. And the point you made up front, that you can't really create thriving data ecosystems without a change in your data culture is spot on. So the question now is, what would a culture transformation look like and why is it so important? This is not a radical change, right? This is really about the evolution of a company's data mindset. Customers want ease of use and they want self-service access to data because they need faster time to value. They need real-time delivery and instant insights. They need their data to accelerate their businesses and their business decisions. Full stop. Now that's a macro story and a micro story around this transformation. The macro story is that businesses rely on data to make these decisions and every company wants to be data driven. I expect that's why so many of you are on this call. People all over the world, like many of you, are relying on data to make actual business decisions. This has become an expectation today. But to do that, you must understand the origin and the lineage of the data sets that lead to a decision. Today, most companies can do this effectively for what I call keystone 
on the really large use cases like customer 360. The real challenge and what we are seeing as the culture transformation at the macro level is that businesses need to do this not just for one use case, but to power hundreds of initiatives, sometimes simultaneously. And they need to access the right data for each of them. Is this sounding familiar to any of you? At the micro level, the team level, businesses are becoming more agile to architect data solutions that enable them to gain insights faster and more confidently. This is new. Traditionally, lines of businesses capture data, they enter data, but they may not really know how that data is managed or what analytics tools are used to derive insights from it. And IT or the data platform operator, they are managing the data sets and the analytics tools. They don't always understand where the data comes from or the value derived from it. And then the risk and the governance and compliance of the data, that's also a separate function. So even though we are all trying to become data driven, there are still major disconnects. Practically speaking, you know, the business users at the end of the day, they may not understand the quality and the lineage of the data that they're working with. So they may not know if they are basing their decisions on the right data. We've all been there. You know, people come to a meeting with different versions of the data and they don't feel they can make accurate decisions because they cannot trust the data. The same thing applies to dashboards and reports. So really being able to shorten the time to insight requires you to collaborate around data in completely new ways. It's really about applying product thinking to your data problems. It's about APIs and SLAs between producers and consumers of data. It's about managing data dependencies as natural parts of doing your business. This is the micro culture transformation that's required to enable the macro narrative at the company level. Today, for example, let's say you have a billing team that generates invoices. It can no longer do consumption metering just to produce the invoice. It also needs to be able to be responsible for managing these consumption data sets and sharing them with the business or the product teams that need to understand this consumption in the context of their business function and analyze user behavior. So literally every business function that relies on data now needs to think about this way of how do they operationalize the data, how do they manage and deliver this data to the rest of the enterprise. This is a critical cultural shift because it means that all these business areas within your organization now actually have a data management responsibility and a function that's required for the teams to be successful. This is also exciting. Now, I may be biased given the business that I'm in. So far, I've talked about one type of data collaboration happening inside the businesses that companies need to operationalize, but there are others happening with outside partners. Modern data-driven organizations also need access to data from a wide variety of sources, both on-premise and in the cloud. While organizations can handle their data that's originating within their four walls, you know, tech leaders are challenged by the complexity of adopting cloud data access, you know, SaaS solutions, streaming this data, sharing it with other partners, so on and so forth. So IT teams and technology partners really need to collaborate and integrate all this data and make it be easily accessible. Lines of business also need to rapidly build new data solutions. So they need access to low code, no code platforms that enable them to do all this. So the culture shift around data is about collaboration and the need to collaborate is driving what we call new data ecosystems that Maribel talked about. Within these new data ecosystems, agile teams can go solve real world business problems with the data because they have fast self-service access to reliable data. This requires decentralizing control of data and reducing dependencies. Of course, doing all this without sacrificing security and compliance and governance. It's not as complicated as it sounds. What does all this mean for you? How can you get ahead of these changes and start collaborating? We've been privileged to work with customers who've been on this journey for most of the last decade. So here's some observations to start from. And this is the most important one. Think data products not data pipeline. What I mean by that is to think in terms of data sets first, rather than the jobs and pipelines that happen to consume and produce data. You need to really know your data sets. 
And for each data set, you know, what does it actually contain? Does it have PII? You know, where, where did the data come from? The core systems, the line of business systems that produced it, whether it actually originated on-prem or in the public cloud or even at the edge. You need to connect these data sources, often some of them in real time, to enable faster insights. You need to take action on the data. Often this action is at the source, not after moving it. You know, this is the reverse ETL use case, which is starting to become more and more important as businesses are looking to operationalize what they do with data. You need to manage the data centrally without consolidating it and be able to do this at scale. You need to be able to provide access to everyone, including self-service access for line of business users. And at a time when the volume and the velocity of data is always increasing, enterprises need AI-powered tools that make sense of all the data, especially when it comes to understanding their customers. Machine learning really holds the key to a new level of insights into your customers, not just who they are and what they're looking for, but what they truly need. We are at the beginning of this journey of realizing the benefits of machine learning from a data architecture perspective. Now, typically, a lot of the focus has been in the other direction, enabling machine learning models to get access to the data that they need to be accurate. But for data professionals, incorporating machine learning into steps like data validation, data cleansing, preparation, and so on, that has the potential to really reduce the amount of human toil and effort that goes into these steps while systematically improving the quality of the data. This is where your technology partner becomes your key collaborator. So Cloudera as a technology partner and a platform provider is at the heart of enabling better access to and better collaboration around data. So open APIs, open standards, open protocols, open file formats, all of these are critical to fostering this collaboration. This is why enterprises must look at their data management vendors as true strategic partners and think in terms of a technology ecosystem that is flexible and adaptable enough to combine data from anywhere, run any type of analytics on any type of data and easily integrate with new technologies as they emerge. We recognize that we are just one part of the customer's data ecosystem and must integrate cleanly with everything else that's happening in their environment. Cloudera also helps customers facilitate innovation and improve or even reinvent their business models. For example, an insurance customer of ours, they offer auto insurance with fairly fixed tiers of coverage. You know, you could get 150K or 300K of coverage. Right? We're all familiar with this. And a lot of this is because this is what their actuarial models were set up to do for decades. Now their challenge, what if we could offer a customer $87,500 worth of coverage or some other very specific amount that the customer wanted? Take this along with, what if you could tune the rates at the zip code level instead of the state level? So considerations like these, because we understood the fundamental reasons behind their data challenge, we were able to help them design a data strategy around it. Or here's another one. We have a customer deploying a cybersecurity use case. This involves collecting user activity logs from more than 100,000 laptops and probably about 30,000 servers spread out across their on-premise data centers and multiple public clouds in their case, AWS and Azure. They actually use our Cloudera data platform, public cloud data services, Cloudera data flow and data engineering to automatically scale their flow and processing needs dynamically with no operator intervention. The destination in their scenario is actually a third party security log mining SaaS solution that runs on a different cloud than where the data originates. They can do all this with the Cloudera data platform because of the flexibility and the breadth of platform support. So what's next? If there's one learning from this talk, it's that it's imperative that your organization speak in the same language when it comes to data so that everyone that needs access to data can get it. To get there, you want to pursue a single view of the data. And that means all enterprise data right, across every line of business, every country that you operate in, every device, 
you know, whether IoT or not, remote laptops, cloud servers, on-prem servers, anything else that you might have deployed. All of this is possible without sacrificing security and governance or operational efficiency because we provide insights into everything related to the data, including legacy and homegrown apps, no matter the source, whether it's employees, contractors, suppliers, distributors, partners, or customers. We know that we are a critical partner to your data, and we know how important your data is to your business. And as a reminder to what Maribel said, it's your role as the data steward to guide business leaders on how to unlock the power of data. Wherever you are on this data journey and whoever you may be working with on it, the key takeaway here is that collaboration is key. Whatever side of that data you're on, you know, partner up within your organization, across teams, with your data and cloud vendors, you're all in this together. Now I'd like to pass it over to one of our customers, Discovery Health, to talk about what they are experiencing with this culture transformation. We're thrilled to have Shirley Colley, Chief Health Analytics Actuary of Discovery Health Service, here to talk about the importance of collaboration. In this case, it was between the public and the private sector during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Shirley. Please welcome Chief Health Analytics Actuary at Discovery Health in South Africa, Shirley Colley. Good morning, everyone, and or, or good evening. Thanks to the TechCrunch and the Cloudera teams for hosting the session. Ram, you spoke eloquently about how a more collaborative approach is helping modern data-driven organizations get easier access to their data from a variety of sources. And that certainly has been the case for us here in South Africa over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have had to make use of both private and public sector data to inform epidemiological views of the pandemic for future reserving and, and provisions for healthcare claims, views on appropriate operational staffing levels to service our clients over a very uncertain period, as well as work with other South African institutions, such as the South African Medical Research Council and the National Institute of Communicable Diseases on vaccine effectiveness assessments. Just to contextualize to your listeners on why we as a company got involved with this, we, we administer and provide managed care services to the largest health insurance fund in South Africa, open to all individuals, regardless of employer, called the Discovery Health Medical Scheme, together with another 19 employer-based schemes. We are therefore considered a, a large stakeholder in South Africa's private healthcare sector and, and uh, about 6.4 billion US dollars, which is equivalent to just under 2% of South Africa's GDP, flows on an annual basis through the healthcare funds we manage. And our organization's core purpose is to enhance and protect our members' lives. Uh, our first public-private collaboration in terms of data sharing was for the Sasonke clinical trial in South Africa. This, this was a large-scale real-world clinical trial which gave COVID-19 vaccination access to half a million healthcare workers in South Africa when the rollout of our mass vaccination campaign faltered due to the decision not to administer the AstraZeneca vaccine prior to the start of our second wave of, of COVID-19 infections. All vaccinations administered over the trial were recorded on the National Electronic Vaccination Database System. The challenge was that for assessing vaccine effectiveness, one needs to compare individuals to, to suitably matched controls um, that, that didn't get, vaccine, get vaccinated. And, and this requires sophisticated data surveillance systems to, to identify these individuals and, and ensure that the people we are matching to have a similar demographic profile as, as measured by their age, sex, and, and comorbidity profile, and being able to follow up these individuals and, and ascertain whether or not that individual was admitted to hospital for COVID-19 treatment and or died from COVID-19. So for the research, we matched which of our clients were vaccinated in the clinical trial and were able and we were able to randomly assign them to, to a suitably matched control 
and follow up these clinical twins until COVID-19 admission or death or, or the end of the study period, as we know which, when, and why any of our clients are in hospital through our B2B authorization system with, with hospitals. And this, this collaboration project is, is, is one that we were extremely proud of and, and which provided reassuring results on, on vaccine durability over our third wave as well, driven by the Delta variant. And I'm very proud to say that this research has, has recently been published in the Lancet Journal. The, the actual use case, though, that I want to focus on is our pulse oximeter outreach benefit, which was inspired by a New York Times article written by a doctor working in an A&E department during the peak of their first wave of infections. And really what this piece explained to us was how a simple device such as a pulse oximeter could decrease mortality rates in high-risk patients. We knew we had substantial data at our fingertips, which could help to identify our clients who might be at higher risk of hospitalization and allow us to take proactive preventative measures like this and help to improve their health. So this spurred us into action and the result was a pulse oximeter outreach initiative deployed on Cloudera Data Science Workbench in order to put our theory into practice. And our main objective was to ensure we were using our data in the best possible way in order to be a force for social good. We deployed our patient X pipeline machine learning model to identify individuals that would be most likely to be at risk of, hos of hospital admission should they contract the virus. And this allowed us to identify these patients and proactively target them with preemptive communications containing advice in order to try and prevent the need for hospital admission. It also enabled us to prioritize patients that should receive a pulse oximeter device, which would monitor oxygen in real time and help to flag issues, issues earlier. This was particularly useful once the number of infected patients started to rise and we identified an, an, an incredible 48% reduction in mortality risk for patients who received a pulse oximeter and we published this work in, in the South African Medical Journal. Working with our big data platform enabled our machine learning models to prioritize those individuals who, who are most at risk of ending up in the hospital, helping preserve the healthcare ecosystem and appropriately use the resources that were becoming so scarce in the face of the virus. As a, as a single integrated platform connecting the entire data lifecycle, our modeling stack offered Discovery Health the chance to combine 900 different data points consisting of demographic, lifestyle, and clinical features to make better informed predictions. Furthermore, Cloudera's consistent governance around PPA, HIPAA, and GDPR allowed us to make sure that clients' privacy remained protected while being able to use sensitive personal customer data to help take life-changing measures. The secure use of these combined sets of data from previous medical history to logged exercise helped determine new factors that could contribute to a heightened risk level. These were additional to the commonly known generic priorities for COVID-19, such as the elderly and those with known underlying health conditions. So for example, we were able to identify that a younger person on the system with diabetes and a history of health issues should actually be prioritized over a 70 year old man that regularly exercised and was in good health. At risk patients were then contacted over the phone and if necessary, received pulse oximeters as a precaution or provided advice on lifestyle changes that may reduce their risk factors. Lower risk individuals were sent an email notification with the best precautions they could take. Thanks to the combined use of the data sets, the, the, the patient X pipeline was proven remarkably accurate when back, back tested against actual admissions of COVID-19 patients. As initially we built this model on, on, on historic patterns of medical respiratory admissions prior to the start of the pandemic. Furthermore, 20,000 additional clients were identified as high risk using the patient X pipeline over and above the standard clinical rules-based classification. 
As a second phase of, of this initiative, we were able to use the insights gathered with the Patient X pipeline to create our COVID-19 Resilience Index. And this is available on Discovery Health's website. The tool uses analytics to calculate each member's risk factors by analyzing lifestyle data we have from our vitality members, such as logged exercise, nutrition patterns, mental health insights, and healthy lifestyle indicators. The index helps inform members on the best way to protect themselves, backed up by real data. With the COVID Resilience Index, um, we were able to get further insights on the significant impact that exercise had on morbidity and mortality rates of COVID-19. And the tool showed, for example, that a 65-year-old man with no chronic conditions who exercises for half an hour at least four times a week has the same mortality risk from COVID-19 as a 45-year-old who exercises once a week. Uh, I invite you to check out this tool on, on our website, www.discovery.co.za. So using the same data sets already established on our Cloudera platform, Discovery Health is prepared to minimize admission and mortality rates for any future outbreaks. This experience has enabled us to expand our models further for different healthcare use cases. For example, it can use the models to, to, to help detect the likelihood of someone developing mental health challenges such as depression based on health-related data sets. Ultimately, through the, loop, through the use of data, we can preempt care instead of re, um, instead of responding retrospectively and gain the ability to help save more lives. Thank you. And now, Maribel Lopez, Ram Venkatesh, and Shirley Colley discuss where do we go from here? Hello and welcome back. I'm thrilled to be here with both Shirley and Ram to have a panel discussion and some reflection on where do we go from here in data ecosystems. Hello, Shirley and Ram. Hi, Hi Maribel. Maribel. All right, I'd like to get started with Shirley. Um, loved your talk, obviously in your field, you're dealing with some large volumes of personally identifiable information. So I imagine that that is one data challenge that you've had to face for the entirety of what you've been doing. But I thought maybe you could speak to some of the other challenges and opportunities that you see today in creating a data ecosystem. Thanks, Maribel. Um, well, one of the challenges is, is dealing with data from a variety of sources, including legacy systems. So one might view the data and, and analytics landscape we have at Discovery Health like a Kadinsky painting. It has some structured and unstructured components. Hidden me meaning is found where you wouldn't anticipate it. But on the whole, it, 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 it really is a beautiful ecosystem. The challenge comes in understanding how best to extract meaning, um, particularly when one is interested in extracting data from, from legacy systems. Many of our data systems have been developed to deliver a particular service or function, and, and um, particularly when it comes to legacy systems, not necessarily designed explicitly with a data output mindset for, for post hoc analysis. So this means that often a lot of work and, and effort is required to normalize, structure newly discovered data sources to analyze it. And, and one needs to have a fairly strong sense of the value of such data, as of course there's an opportunity cost if, if low value data sources are prioritized over, over potentially more meaningful data sets. Um, but having said this, it's important that the entire organization understands the importance of data and that accurately having the fingerprints of data recorded efficiently and available for analysis to empower future decision making. So it's important in, in today's data driven culture to think intentionally about how data is generated, stored and available for analysis and reporting by bringing together the appropriate skill sets from the get go for any new project. I absolutely agree. I mean, um... One of the interesting things that we're seeing is trying to think about what the new outcomes could be and then mapping you know, our data to try to figure out how do we get to the next stage. Are you looking at anything different in terms of outcomes from where you started or what kinds of outcomes are you trying to measure today? 
Um, so there, there are many outcomes we're trying to measure on any given day, but I'll speak about a few projects I'm, I'm very excited and proud of. One of them is our planned launch of our hospital rating system, which will be a first in, in, in the private sector in South Africa by applying a consistent measurement framework across all hospitals um, for, for consumers. This rating incorporation, incorporates patients' experience metrics co collected from survey data, cost efficiency um, from, from claims data, readmission performance using our hospital authorization data, and, and mortality outcomes using our audited mortality data. So some other projects I'm very excited about include working with our system architects to productionize our machine learning models as part of the normal software development life cycle of, of our systems to intelligently guide internal case management workflow to, to ultimately improve um, patient outcomes. I think that is the goal for so many of us in the healthcare field is to improve patient outcomes. And there's so many different ways that we can do that, which is thrilling with, with the data that we have. Ram, I'd like to turn it over to you for a minute. Um, you're working with many customers of all types. All of them are different. But I'm wondering, you know, what's changed in the technology landscape that would allow these companies to more seamlessly create data-driven cultures? I mean, are there any common threads that you're seeing in organizations? Yeah, look, the, the common Uber thread, Maribel, is really around, you know, enabling you to focus on the business problem as a customer and not, uh, not on the infrastructure, right? So I think under this common thread, I kind of see like three key mega trends, right? One is public cloud and specifically SaaS adoption we believe this is a trend that's going to continue right? and it's going to be raise the bar on manageability and total cost of ownership, even in highly regulated environments like healthcare that Shirley was talking about. The whole goal here is by actively removing human toil, just the waste that's in the system right now in terms of how inefficient it is for our customers to get the value that they need from their data, and consequently, by doing that, you know, you can take cost out of the equation, right? We all get more efficient by having to manage lesser parts of the system, if you will. So this is one trend that we see that is definitely behind a lot of the ways that our customers think about their data landscapes and their ecosystems. The other side of this coin is the need for flexibility, right? So we see this in companies' desire to interoperate, right? You know, today businesses are dealing with a lot of uncertainty. So it's kind of important not to forget the expensive lessons of the previous decade with respect to you know, single vendor or single point solutions, right? So we believe that for our customers, open protocols, open data standards, open APIs, that these are only more relevant and more important in this sort of ecosystem way of looking at things, right? Any technology provider, any solution provider on the landscape today can solve a slice of the problem, right? And so the need for us to work together to deliver solutions that can touch all the parts, just Shirley was mentioning, there's like this diversity of sources, diversity of ways to transform data, ways to analyze data, ways to get outcomes. All of these, there is so much of choice that is implied behind the way you know, our customers want to manage their data landscape. That's the thing that is driving the ecosystem to become more open, to become more interoperable, right? So I feel like that's another sort of Uber trend that's driving a lot of the ways that customers are thinking about their data. The third piece, and since this is a data conversation, I think this is really important. It's the maturity of the, you know, if you will, the cloud native storage model, right? So we see this with the improvements that Amazon is making in the S3 service, we see this with Microsoft Azure and the ADLS Gen 2 service and how far that's come along. We also see this in the adoption of our private cloud storage technologies, right? including Apache Ozone and its S3 compatible API. But this is one of these fundamental enablers. Right? So it enables disaggregated storage and compute for all of the analytics solutions that, that our customers are, are either looking to deploy now or they know they have to in the future. So just that infinite scale that they would need, which is implied in the in, in the diversity of the data solution that I'm describing here, I think that that's the third mega trend that I see continuing to power the needs of our customers. Ram, I love where you're going with this because there's 
there's a lot that's changed since we first started this dialogue, right? You bring up cloud. And what I love about cloud is it allows everybody to participate in a data ecosystem because you now have scale. Um, you now have tooling in the cloud that you didn't have in the past. Um, in your discussion earlier, you talked about uh, using machine learning to help with some of the data engineering challenges that people have. So I think all of these are really important changes. And you mentioned open. And one of the big differences, I think, particularly as we move to collaborative data ecosystems, mm -hmm. is this concept of openness allows us to participate in more ecosystems. Because before, I think people were trying to build very specific proprietary things between a smaller set of organizations. And now you have the opportunity to interact with open data, to have um, basically APIs and systems that allow you to more freely exchange with a broader grouping of people. And I think that can only be good for data ecosystems. And in your talk, you said, um, think in terms of data sets first, rather than jobs and pipelines that will happen and consume data. And this to me sounded like a best practice for organizations, but what are some of the other press, best practices that you're seeing, you know, maybe they're related to data governance or other things? Ron, this is for yeah. you. Probably I can, I can think of a couple in the data governance space, right, that are key. Uh, the first one is about like the distinction between policy versus mechanism, right? Especially when it comes to mm -hmm. authorization, you know, as, as customers, you should really be thinking about what do you want to express in terms of how do you want your data to be secured? You know, I would like to allow access to people who have these rights and privileges who are operating in these countries at these times of the day, abstractly being able to specify what you want and then letting the system figure out and enforce the underlying mechanisms to, to implement authorization. I think that's, that's really one way to scale. You should be thinking about, as you're thinking data sets, you're thinking about hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of tables, tens of millions of columns. So any mechanism that you use for authorization has to be implicitly capable of scaling up to the needs that you have. And this is one of those areas where I feel you can help, you know, we can put data science to work for you. This is where having predictable classification and data profiling can really help you avoid catastrophic failures. Like imagine if, if automatically, if you could identify data that was coming in as PII, and then all the policies that you want to apply to PII data just happens. Like you could do this today and you should take advantage of it, right? The third piece is, especially when it comes to governance, you have to be thinking end to end. Think of this as, you know, data governance, I think is like, it's like a balloon. And so if, if the air goes out of the balloon at any one place, you know, the, the result can be really not what you want for your business, right? And so this is why we believe that rather than thinking of data governance in the context of point use cases, you have to think holistically. This is one of those areas where it's really important to have an end-to-end -end strategy. Does that make sense? It does. And I think the thinking holistically, you know, I think a lot of organizations, it's just a real big rethink of what are we trying to do and how do we do it? And I think everything was very siloed before. And now we're moving into this different environment where thinking holistically is a, is a big phrase when you, when you really think about it and unpack that versus thinking of this specific workflow at that specific time. So I'm happy to hear that we're actually starting to change that dialogue within organizations and thinking about everybody being able to use data. And this brings me back to maybe surely we could talk a little bit about this. You know, there, there is a need for people in process transformation. I'm sure as you were looking at this, um, this is something you encountered. Are there any thoughts around best practices for people in process transformation? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I think we um, also were, were kind of, even though I'm, I'm personally trained as, as an actuary, many of my colleagues are, are trained as, as actuaries or as statisticians, et cetera. Um, you know, this, this whole world of data science, machine learning, et cetera, really started, I would say, um, becoming more mainstream probably now eight to, 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 to five years ago. 
And it, it, it really was a challenge around thinking about how do we create a, a, a culture of learning so that these nascent skill sets that a couple of individuals in, 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 in the team um, are, are developing actually gets used as a, as a standard across the, 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 the analytic function. So I think the, the most important thing is, um, you know, one, one can think about people transformation and, and, and process transformation, and, and it really starts with people. And um, it's the, the, the most important thing, that I think, is creating a culture of learning. Um, the, the, the world is uncertain. Um, things are changing and, and, and we need to be adaptable and, and a culture of learning definitely um, helps, helps teams remain flexible and responsive to the environment. And um, once we get, you know, people create the processes. So, so it's, it's, you know, forward looking skilled people will figure out what is the required pro process transformation required in an organization. Um, so in, in our team, we've built a very thorough induction process, which, which has been running for a number of years. Um, and, and while we've built it for our new joiners joining straight out of university, it's actually become a framework of learning for, for the entire team. Um, the senior leadership team created the bones of, of our induction. Um, and, and in that, we define the background, the purpose, and, and, and the context um, for our analytic area. The company and the organization does have a generic training program, but we thought it very important for, for individuals in our specialized area to have very specific training and understanding the data sources, how to access data and, and, and use it and, and um, apply appropriate algorithms to, to um, the appropriate business questions. So um, it, it's really about getting the whole team involved um, and um, new joiners um, that have joined our team very, very shortly after joining are already contributing to, to, to business output. Um, so it's, it's really about creating the culture and the bones for transformation and, and knowledge sharing to take place. And, and that, um, I think, is absolutely key to, to, to people and, and both, both people and process transformation, Maribel. I think the companies that are doing it best really are developing a culture of learning and they really are thinking about different educational programs. I think when organizations start and someone comes into the organization, they get training at that point. But this constant, hey, the tools are changing, what we're trying to do is changing, how we're using data is changing, and everybody in the organization needs to have a different mindset, but also a different level of knowledge about what data is, what data can do, how we look at data, understanding how to even assess whether or not we think this is the right data. These are skills that we all need as individuals if everybody in the organization is going to be using data. So thank you for that. Ram, what are you seeing on your side? I think it's uh, it's very complementary to what Shirley is describing. You know, a lot of the lessons that companies have learned from the, the microservice wars and those deployments, they're all applicable to data, right? So it starts off with small teams, agile teams, right? Three, four people who are confident that they can do, you know, they can they can deliver on the on the business case or the outcome that they are going after for a data problem. Just helping them be confident that they can do this in a smaller focused initiatives that they can measure in probably weeks or a small number of months. This is like contrast this with, you know, a, a, a master data management project would be like a two-year endeavor that has the feel of a United Nations briefing or something like that, right? So data use cases now are evolving to these very tight product thinking being applied to just roll out solutions that can take advantage of data and having the people culture mindset that sort of underpins that, right? So that's one. And, you know, building on top of that, it's the dependencies that these teams have. The way you get these small teams to be hyper-efficient is where they don't have to do it all themselves. Right, so they sh they need to be able to like discover and find the data sets and treat data dependencies just like they would treat dependencies in software, right? And so that is a very powerful enabler because now you can have teams that can deliver very fast on what they need to do and they can depend on others in the organization, right? So it's a team sport at the macro level, not just like like within a single team, right? So I think that's that is from a from a people culture standpoint enabling that 
safely, I think is something that uh, should go into this overall training that 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 surely described, right? But I think the fundamental mindset change is really while governance is global, right? you know, they say all politics is local. I think all data ownership is very local, right? So being able to really help people understand and own their own data, right? The data that they are producing, the data that they are consuming, for them to be able to understand its relevance, its importance, that is part of the culture transformation that I think is really exciting. Because once you do that, then they know that they have this asset that they can go work with other groups inside the company to make, to, to, to derive even more value, right? So now you have these ambassadors of data. It's kind of how I see, you know, the customers who are doing this extremely well are able to scale the number of use cases, not because they have like some giant top-down central organization, but because they have agile teams that know what they're doing, right? That they can execute dependably and they know how they can go work with others to network with others to, to increase value. So data is a team sport, go local. Very much. <laughs> Love it. Very much so, yes. Uh, Shirley, as we come to a close, I wanted to ask you a question about what would be one piece of advice you'd like to leave the audience with? Obviously we've gone through many things, but is there something you're like, if we did nothing else, do this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it 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 links uh, Maribel to to what Ram said. It 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 really is about a team sport. Um, I think just in general for people, obviously, keep reading, keep learning, but but keep speaking to people across the organization. Um, not only does it create different vantage points, but it, it, it can also create mutually beneficial opportunities for, for collaboration. And, and, and likewise with external partners and, and, and stakeholders. So any, I mean, the, the, the main piece of advice for me is keep learning and, 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 and keep speaking. <laughs> Wonderful. Ram, what's your thoughts on this? I think the main thing, and this is uh, harder for leaders as much as teams is patience. Because I think that you know, transformation, especially of the kind that we are describing here, it's really it changes the way we work. And that's really hard, right? Because it needs us to sort of understand what the constraints of today are, and also sort of having that eye towards what you want the future to look like, right? So I think that this is, this transformation is one where we have many, many of our customers have been on this journey for a while, and they're going to continue to be on this journey for, you know, for the foreseeable future, right? So I think viewing this transformation through that lens helps helps you frame up what are the objectives that you want in this phase of the transformation, as opposed to, oh, there's this perfect state that we're going to be in 18 months, right? Because you know that 18 months are going to come around and that's the next set of things you've learned and you've got to go evolve. So I think just continuous learning and being patient about the outcomes that you want, like you know, designing this for the long haul, as opposed to tactical objectives, I think is going to be very beneficial. And I guess to close, I'll pick up on something you just said, Ram. And I think that you mentioned that it's a journey. And when I think about it, I think that the tools are always changing, but the problems and challenges are always changing. So it's a living entity. It's never done. And I think the way that you assess it is to say, are we getting better at it? Are we, are we faster? Are we more agile than we were in the past? Do we think that we're getting um, more complete information to do what we want to do and the right information? And I think if you're doing that, you're doing very well. So with that, thank you on behalf of TechCrunch and Cloudera for coming to this data and cultural transformation event. Please welcome back Maribel Lopez. <clears throat>
Overall, Ram and Shirley shared examples of how companies across various industry segments are moving from reacting to events to creating a data-driven business. What's clear to me is that if you want to excel in today's business world, you must develop new ways of thinking about data. The new data culture requires tightly aligning with the business on its goals, mapping the right analytic solutions to various problems, and defining ways to improve your business with third-party information and data ecosystems. The opportunities before us are nearly limitless based on the breadth of solutions we have today. The critical challenge for us all is to reimagine how we can create new opportunities by unlocking the power of our data. If you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to the Gloudterra team. Thank you for your time and attention today. I look forward to seeing what experiences you'll deliver by leveraging the power of your data and data ecosystems.